Hello, everybody. We're starting to level off, and thanks for joining us. My name is Haley Paul, and I'm the Policy Director at National Audubon Society here in Arizona. More people are kind of uh, joining in, so uh, I'm going to do a few logistics, and then we'll officially launch into this webinar. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar, Understanding Arizona's Groundwater. I hope you and your families are hanging in during these difficult times. Today, Jocelyn Gibbon of Freshwater Policy Consulting and I will be co-presenting. If you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and we'll respond to some of them as we go. So feel free to type in clarifying questions as you have them. I will note that this is a slightly different format that, than we've done in the past. So if you are trying to type a question and you want everyone to see it, you can select um, all panelists and attendees in the chat. Otherwise, it's going to default to just going to uh, us, the panelists. So if you see that in your chat and you want to toggle to and attendees, you can do that. All right, so we have reserved time at the end of the presentation, the, the end of this presentation for questions and discussion as well. This webinar is also streaming on Facebook Live. So if you're watching on Zoom and having any technical issues, Try visiting facebook.com slash AudubonAZ and watching there instead. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will be sure to make it available after the conclusion of this presentation. So I will do next slide, please. Thank you. So here's a little overview of what we are going to cover in today's presentation. Thanks. Next slide. All right. So what is groundwater exactly? Well, groundwater is the water that is found in the cracks, crevices, and spaces between soil, sand, and rock underground. It is the source of water for springs and wells, and groundwater allows some rivers to flow year-round by providing a base flow of water in between snowmelt runoff and rain events. Base flow is water that seeps into the river or stream from groundwater. Next slide. So here's a great diagram that I stole from the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association blog. And what I want you to zero in on is the representation of the blue water occurring in between the spaces of the gray rock. Groundwater is not an underground lake. Next slide. Sorry for my delay, it's just a little slow when the slides transition, but I think we're okay. So how does groundwater form? Natural groundwater recharge takes place when rainfall, stream flow, or melting snow percolates or sinks down into the ground. An aquifer is a layer of underground sand, gravel, or permeable rock where water collects. And then the water table is the upper surface of that aquifer saturated with water. Next slide. So here's another really nice visual representation of groundwater with a bit more emphasis on how groundwater and surface water or river water are connected. I'll just linger on that for a second. I think that's a nice, a nice image. Next slide, please. So what I want to emphasize with this slide is the fact that not all aquifers are the same. There are different types of aquifers throughout the West, and the aquifer type affects the quantity, the quality, and the availability of groundwater. Here in Arizona, we have primarily two types of aquifers, the Colorado Plateau aquifers and the Basin and Range Basin Fill aquifers. The main difference between the two is geology. The Colorado Plateau aquifers tend to be composed of permeable rock, while the basin fill aquifers tend to be composed of gravel, sand, and silt. Next slide. So while I am a very far cry from a hydrogeologist, what I wanted to highlight with this slide was that in a large portion of Arizona, what is called the Basin and Range Province, 
we have unique geologic features that have allowed for large deposits of water to accrue over millions of years. While the hydrogeology of the basin and range aquifers allowed for the accrual of ample water supplies, we must remember that it took millions of years to accrue and, if not managed sustainably, it can take just decades to deplete. Much of the water we utilize from these aquifers is ancient water. Next slide. So according to the University of Arizona, Arizona's basin and range aquifers fill up, filled up, built up over the past 25 million years as geologic processes deposited sediment off of mountains and into nearby mountain ranges. Nearby basins, excuse me. Gravel, sand, and clay built up. Then, as water streamed off nearby mountain ranges from melting snow and rain, that water easily infiltrated those gravelly and sandy basins, building up the groundwater supplies that we benefit from today. Next slide. So in the Colorado Plateau aquifers, groundwater is also ancient and replenished by rain and snow melt. However, instead of sandy basins collecting water, these aquifers are formed and differentiated by layers of rock and sediment that trap water in different aquifers depending on their depth. Here you can see the shallower Coconino aquifer and the deeper Redwall aquifer and how groundwater in those different aquifers feed springs out of the walls of the Grand Canyon. Next slide. And I wanted to provide a little context for why geology matters for groundwater. So the city of Williams has some of the deepest wells in the country. This is because the top aquifer, that Coconino aquifer that I showed in the previous slide, has run out of water in their area. And now the city has to drill deeper past hundreds of feet of rock to reach a new aquifer and a new source of groundwater, that Redwall aquifer from the previous slide. Next slide. So now that I have attempted to give you a crash course in Arizona's hydrogeology, why do we care so much about groundwater? Well, for starters, it makes up about 40% of the state's water supply. Next slide. And groundwater is often the sole source of water for many communities in Arizona. Here you can see the percentage of groundwater versus surface water used in various parts of the state. Surface water is water from rivers, lakes, and streams. The blue areas shown here depend primarily on surface water, while the green areas depend primarily on groundwater. The gray areas have a mix of water supply. Next slide. We also care about groundwater because it is critical to Arizona's rivers, streams, and springs and help support diverse wildlife and ecosystems. Arizona is the most biologically diverse state without a coastline, third to only California and Texas in the number of different species that reside within or migrate through its borders. Groundwater is what allows Arizona's rivers to flow in between precipitation events and sometimes even through periods of extended drought. Rivers and the riparian habitat they support are of outsized importance to people, birds, fish, and other wildlife. Next slide. So here is a map of rivers and streams in Arizona. Some of these stretches no longer have water in them, but for those that do flow in, pre in between precipitation events and snowmelt, they rely on groundwater to sustain that flow. Next slide. And in addition to our rivers and streams, springs are also reliant on groundwater. Not only are springs a rich ecological resource, they are important to communities' water supplies. So, given the importance of groundwater, let's now dive into how it is managed in the state. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jocelyn.
Hi, thank you, Haley. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, so we've heard why groundwater matters in our state. Next, we're going to talk about how it's managed and treated under Arizona's laws. And to understand the basic outline, it's helpful to take a very quick trip through history to see how the laws came to be. Next slide, please. So starting by looking way back, of course, water has always been critical to people who have lived in what is now Arizona. There is a rich history of water stewardship and management by indigenous people in our region dating back thousands of years. As just two examples, on the left, we see evidence of an extensive canal system built by ancestors of the Odom people in the Salt and Gila River Valleys more than a thousand years ago. On the right, we see a Hopi farmer sharing how the Hopi have been dry land farming in their homeland for the last 2,000 years or more. Next slide. So our current water law regime traces back to European expansion into this area. So now we're talking several hundred years ago. Early miners and irrigators who arrived in the West first made use of surface water, the water in rivers, streams, and lakes. At first, there weren't any agreed upon and formal laws about who got what water. And yet it was necessary to take water out of rivers and streams for both irrigation and mining purposes. So those new settlers developed a system of divvying up scarce surface water um, that's called prior appropriation. It was based on a principle described as first in time, first in right, or I like to think of it as first come, first served. Whoever first took water out of a stream and put it to use was given an ongoing right to take that same amount of water the next year and the year after that. People who came later were only able to claim water if it didn't interfere with earlier already established uses. So what started as an informal practice was over time adopted into the law by US territories and then states in the West, including Arizona. Under the prior appropriation system, a landowner gets a right to surface water by taking the water out of the river, at least in most cases, and putting it to what is called a beneficial use. You get a priority date that corresponds to when you first started using water, which is effectively your property's place in line. These surface water rights are considered to be appurtenant or attached to the land where the water was first used, and you can only move your right to different acres by going through a special process, which is now called a sever and transfer in Arizona law. Next. So in Arizona, as elsewhere, prior appropriation is still the law of the land today. Arizona law still recognizes senior water rights according to where water was first put to use. Although now you also have to go through an administrative process to apply for a new surface water right. And at this point, most people consider Arizona's rivers to already be almost, if not completely, fully allocated or appropriated. Before we move on from surface water, I should also mention that this is state law and applies to most surface water in Arizona, but there is a whole other set of laws that applies to water from the Colorado River because it's a multi-state river, and there's federal law that applies to water rights associated with Native American lands, as well as to rights associated with federal lands like national parks or forests. Next slide. So thinking back again to the time of European expansion and settlement in the Southwest, groundwater was at first more difficult to access than surface water in rivers and streams. People used hand dug wells to access groundwater at first that were powered by humans, as in cranking a handle, and then by burrows or other animals, and then by steam engines, all before there was widespread access to electricity to pump water out of the ground. From the beginning, groundwater was treated as being separate from streams, rivers, and other surface water. And if the custom around surface water was first come, first served, the custom around groundwater was essentially help yourself. If you could sink a well and pump from it, you did. There was nothing to stop you. And uses were few and small enough that mostly at first, this didn't create conflicts. As with the custom around surface water, this help yourself custom around groundwater was also confirmed by territorial and state courts and the legislature and evolved into what is referred to as the reasonable use doctrine. Next. Under this doctrine, a landowner may withdraw and use groundwater for any reasonable and beneficial use. And if you think about it, this is very different from the prior appropriation system we just talked about for surface water, where you need to have a surface water right 
The reasonable use doctrine doesn't require you to get a water right or to evaluate how your pumping might affect the groundwater supply or others' access to water. Let's go to the next slide. So moving forward in time, Arizona was very sparsely populated in its early days as a territory and a state, but population growth really took off after World War II with the advent of air conditioning, widespread electricity, and also deep turbine pumps that allowed for pumping of groundwater at a scale previously unimagined. Go to the next slide. Within decades of this new growth and technology, major population centers and agricultural areas in the state experienced dramatic declines in groundwater levels. Here, a Republic article says that in 1966, nearly two thirds of the water used in the state came from underground with declining water levels, levels common in nearly all highly developed areas. The article also talks about large drops in groundwater levels in agricultural areas. There was growing alarm as water supplies were depleted and areas experienced consequences like land subsidence where the land actually collapses and drops as water is pumped out from under it. Next slide. These groundwater declines came at a time when Arizonans were increasingly clamoring for the development of the long sought after Central Arizona project to bring Colorado River water into the interior of the state providing an additional water supply to some of these areas facing groundwater declines. Next. The Central Arizona Project Canal was authorized in 1968 and constructed starting in 1973, with its first water delivery made in 1985. It carries water into the most populous central areas of Arizona, as you can see there around Phoenix and Tucson. The canal is in red on the map with the CAP service area in yellow. At the time that it was being developed, the federal government told Arizona that if the feds were going to keep funding the project's construction, Arizona needed to do something about its groundwater problems. The federal government didn't want to invest in an expensive solution to overpumping of groundwater if the overpumping was just going to continue. Next slide. So Arizona, in part because of this federal ultimatum, passed the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. Next slide. The Groundwater Management Act established our current groundwater code. It was considered necessary to protect and stabilize the general economy and welfare of the state and its citizens. Next slide. So the act created two types of special groundwater management areas called AMAs or active management areas and INAs, irrigation non-expansion areas. There are currently five AMAs and three INAs in the state as shown here. And the law also defines a process for creating new ones. In AMAs and INAs, there are additional requirements related to groundwater use beyond just reasonable use. So how is water managed within an AMA? There's a set of tools and requirements that are used to manage water in these areas. And we'll take a quick trip uh, at a pretty high level through these. So they include groundwater rights that were established based on existing water use when the AMA was created. Inside an AMA, a person needs a groundwater right or another kind of permit or authority in order to pump groundwater. Next, well spacing rules. These rules require that if you're going to drill and pump from a new well, you have to first assess how much it will impact nearby wells. And if the impact is too great, you have to modify, move, or simply not drill your planned well to protect your neighbor's water supply and access. Next is non-expansion of irrigation. So this is a big one. Once an AMA is established, no additional irrigated lands can be brought under cultivation. Agriculture is the biggest water user in Arizona, as in most of the West. So the idea at the time was that limiting the growth of irrigation would slow the depletion of groundwater. Next, we have management plans and goals. Every AMA has a management goal. In many of them, it is safe yield, meaning a balancing of what goes in and what comes out. Management plans are required to be created by the Department of Water Resources every 10 years, 
and each can impose some additional conservation requirements on water users in order to try to reach the AMA's goal. Next, the Assured Water Supply Program. This applies in all AMAs, and it requires that before a new subdivision can be developed, the developer must determine that there is 100-year assured water supply available. There are very specific definitions in the law of what counts as an assured water supply, and these are intended to also help meet the management goals. So finally, Arizona's AMAs have a very sophisticated and extensive recharge and recovery program that allows water users to store water underground, get a credit like in a bank account, and then pump it back out for future use. Next slide. So that's the AMAs. Arizona's three INAs are in light blue on this map. INAs have way fewer tools or requirements compared to AMAs, but there's that big one. In INAs, as in AMAs, irrigation cannot be expanded onto new land after creation of the INA. Irrigation in this context essentially means using water to grow crops on two or more acres for sale or for people to eat or for animal feed. Next slide. So the Groundwater Management Act created AMAs and INAs, but outside of these areas in what we sometimes call greater or rural Arizona, groundwater is still largely unregulated. At least outside of sovereign tribal lands, groundwater in rural Arizona is governed uh, primarily by the legal doctrine of reasonable use. And rural Arizona isn't necessarily completely rural anymore. Um, as you can see, if you think about what's in that blue area, it includes some fast growing areas. The areas outside of the AMAs make up about 80% of the state's footprint and are home to more than one and a half million people. Um, before we move on from the slide, I want to say that there are a few small caveats. Um, outside of the AMAs, there is what's called an adequate water supply program, but this is very different from the assured water supply program inside the AMAs. And in short, it doesn't require that new development actually have an adequate supply of water. There are also some restrictions throughout Arizona on transferring groundwater from one groundwater basin or subbasin to another. Let's go to the next slide. But to repeat, in the majority of the state, there are very few requirements related to groundwater. And in most cases, a landowner may still withdraw and use groundwater for any reasonable and beneficial use. And nobody has yet been told that they have to stop their use because it doesn't qualify as reasonable. Let's go to the next slide. What this means in practice is that in most of Arizona, a landowner may initiate a new water use and pump and withdraw groundwater, even if it causes declines or dries up neighboring wells, even if in total, the amount of water that is being withdrawn exceeds what is recharged into the aquifer, leading to depletion of long-term supplies. And even if the pumping depletes the water flowing in connected rivers, streams, or springs, interfering with not only the river or stream itself and riparian vegetation, as you can see here, but also potentially with established surface water uses. All of this, of course, can also lead to conflicts among water users. Let's go to the next slide. Conflicts are made worse in some areas by what is sometimes called Arizona's bifurcated water law, which means that, as we've seen, surface water and groundwater are largely treated as two different things under the law, even though, next slide, they are often intimately connected, and thus what hydrogeologists refer to as a single resource. This means that groundwater and surface water users are sometimes accessing what's actually the same water supply under the legal pretense that they're different. Next slide. So there's one additional wrinkle here, which we don't have time to go into the details of today, but there's also a category of water called subflow, which is water that is pumped from underground but that Arizona courts determined to be so closely connected to surface water that it is actually surface water under the law and requires a water right and a priority date in order to use. But so far in most parts of the state, it hasn't been finally determined who is pumping subflow or what will happen to those pumpers who have a well 
are found to be pumping subflow, which is surface water, but didn't go through the administrative process that's required to acquire a surface water right because they were pumping water from out of the ground. This greatly complicates and intensifies the challenges in some parts of the state. Next slide. So there's nothing to stop us from continuing to add to the problem because there is nothing in our law that prevents us from drilling new wells in most areas. Here in this series of images that Haley and her team put together, we see how the number of wells has increased just since 1980, um, first looking at the Wallapai Valley groundwater basin. This is near Kingman, you can see that map. Next, we'll look at the Wilcox Basin down in Southeast Arizona. And if you don't have time to read the legend, the, the red dots are the smaller wells and the orange dots, the larger wells. Next, we're looking at the Verde River Groundwater Basin. And again, these are all from 1980 to 2020. This is the Big Sandy. And next we'll go to the Cienega Creek groundwater basin. I think this is the last one. Um, this basin is one where tributaries to the Santa Cruz and the San Pedro rivers originate. So we've seen that groundwater is essentially unregulated outside of the AMAs in Arizona. And the consequences are already showing up in different communities across the state. Um, as we move into this section, I wanted to also note that there was a series of articles in the Republic late last year um, that tell stories um, about some of these impacts. Uh, and I think we're gonna have that link for you in the chat box. You'll see some of the headlines in our slides. Next. Unconstrained groundwater pumping has led to declining water levels, just as it did in Phoenix and Tucson, for example, before adoption of the Groundwater Management Act. This slide shows declines in water levels that the Arizona Department of Water Resources has observed in its index wells in the last 10 years in a few groundwater basins that may be among the hot spots for groundwater declines. The Wilcox Basin is in green on the map over in southeastern Arizona. The McMullen Basin is in blue in west central Arizona. And the Wallapai Basin, which supplies the city of Kingman, is the red one in the northwest. Let's go to the next slide. We're also seeing impacts to existing wells and thus water users. As we said in rural Arizona, there is no requirement that those who are developing new wells assess what impact that well will have on nearby wells. As a result, increasingly in parts of the state, there are stories about new deep wells being drilled, in some cases by large out-of-state or international agricultural ventures, leading to neighboring wells, sometimes of long-standing residents, drying up. Newspaper articles have even been reporting about some families who have bought homes only to have their wells dry up within a few years, leaving them without water. Sometimes new large ag is displacing older farms with shallower wells. Um, and in thinking about why it matters that there, exist, there are impacts to existing wells, in some cases drilling a new well would cost tens of thousands of dollars, so it's cost prohibitive. And in some cases, it's not possible to drill a productive replacement well on your property after a well goes dry. Next slide. Of course, unconstrained groundwater pumping also has implications for communities' water supplies as a whole. One of the most dramatic examples is in Kingman, where the Wallapai Basin, the primary source of Kingman's water, may have fewer than 60 years of accessible groundwater remaining 
at least without getting down uh, beyond 1,200 feet. Ultimately, the lack of tools and authorities to protect rural groundwater water will be a problem not just for Kingman, but for many Arizona communities since, as Haley told us, most communities in non-AMA Arizona are dependent on groundwater as a primary or even sole water supply. Some communities also rely on water from groundwater fed rivers and streams, so those supplies can also be at risk. So finally, we've seen and are seeing the impacts of unconstrained groundwater pumping on rivers, streams, and springs, and more are potentially at risk in the future. Here are just a few examples. On the left is the Verde River, where the springs that used to feed the river's headwaters and were the water supply for areas as far away as the Grand Canyon, they actually took the water to the Grand Canyon by uh, rail, um, are close to dried up. When combined with agricultural diversions of surface water, this has left about five miles of what used to be the Verde's headwaters without water. Water levels in the Verde River throughout its length have been found to have declined by as much as 10,000 acre feet a year, or 8%, because of groundwater pumping over the last century, and are projected to continue to decline quite significantly. In the top center here is Havasu Creek on the Havasupai Reservation in the Grand Canyon. The springs that feed Havasu, Havasu Creek are among the many in the Grand Canyon region, that are considered vulnerable to depletions from groundwater pumping. Underneath the picture of Havasu, we see a shot of the Santa Cruz River, whose flow has disappeared in certain stretches because of groundwater pumping over many years. And on the far right, we see the San Pedro River. Again, stretches that used to flow year-round are now intermittent. They only flow for part of the year. And pumping threatens to continue to dry up this river, leading to litigation and conflict. Next slide. In general, in fact, these challenges lead to conflicts. As water users, including communities, farmers, homeowners, businesses, face declining supplies and a lack of recourse or ability to do anything about it. Individual water users don't have good tools to address these issues because they are not built into our law. And even local communities, cities, towns, and counties have limited authorities to manage water. Under Arizona law, local jurisdictions generally don't have authority over water resources unless the state legislature chooses to give them that authority. Next. While rural Arizonans don't have access to many tools, various tools for managing groundwater do exist and in fact are part of life for people and water users almost everywhere else in the West. Next slide. In fact, rural Arizona is the last and only place in the Colorado River Basin, save perhaps for a few tiny pieces of California, where a state-issued permit, groundwater right, or similar authority is not required to initiate a new groundwater use. In this graphic from our colleagues at EDF, the colored area is the Colorado River Basin. Everywhere in green, before initiating a new groundwater use, you have to obtain a groundwater right or meet the requirements for some other type of authorization to use groundwater. And in most cases, you have to go through some kind of permitting process or analysis to determine if there is groundwater left to be divvied up and whether your new use will interfere with someone's existing ability to use groundwater, or in some cases, surface water. In rural Arizona, so which is most of what the orange colored area is here, there is no such requirement. Next. So it's typically a statewide legal regime that requires these rights or permits in many areas of the West, including in all of the cross-hatched areas here. But most states, including Arizona, also structure their groundwater management so that there are special management areas, the colored areas here, which are specific areas, usually groundwater basins, where additional management tools or regulatory requirements apply often tailored to meet local challenges. And local tailoring is incredibly important. For example, in Arizona, AMAs and INAs may not be the right fit for some other areas of the state. Sometimes, in fact, that is where the dialogue about rural groundwater has ended in Arizona. An AMA isn't the right fit, so there must be nothing that can be done. But when you look around the Colorado River Basin states, which are shown here, the rest of the West, and even beyond, 
it turns out that there are a plethora of tools that can be used to manage groundwater, including the ones used in each of these states and each of these brightly colored basins. Of course, it's never easy. No tool is by itself a silver bullet, and the same tools or collection of tools don't make sense everywhere. But there are options to choose from or to use as inspiration and lessons that can be learned. So we're going to talk next about some of the tools that could be in a toolbox based on what's been used elsewhere or in parts of Arizona or has been a part of a conversation here. Next. So this section could be a long discussion by itself. And I want to emphasize that we're not saying that any of these examples are the right tools for any particular place. But we wanted to give you a little flavor of some of the potential tools. Um, and also note that as I go through this, I'm not going to talk about each of the tools that shows up um, here in the slides. So first, there are tools that can be used to conserve or limit the amount of water used by individual water users or types of users. Some of these are already possible for local municipalities to adopt here in Arizona. For example, conservation ordinances like the ones in Sierra Vista, Payson, Clarkdale, Flagstaff, and Cottonwood, just to name a few that include recommendations or requirements related to landscaping with native or low water use plants. Some Arizona water providers are already using a tiered rate structure where prices increase as water use increases beyond what's required to meet basic needs. Many of the other tools that we'll talk about, however, can't currently be adopted by an Arizona city, town, or county without a change in state law. And many won't work as effectively at the level of a city or a town, for example, as if a whole groundwater basin is managed as a whole. For example, water duties or water right quantities give each user the right to use up to a certain amount of water. That's not something a local city or county, for example, can just decide to put into place. The last one on the list here, limits on types of use, can vary from something like saying no new big lakes can be filled with groundwater to preferred types of uses, which exist in some basins um, in different states, to something like the prohibition of expansion of irrigation that we saw in the AMAs and the INAs. Next slide. Some of the tools that are out there to help to, that are out there um, help to protect specific existing uses or specific areas or resources. We already talked about well spacing requirements in the AMAs, which are designed to help prevent negative impacts on existing wells. Um, and I've also said that there are similar requirements that exist statewide and in most Western states, requiring an analysis of impacts before a new well is drilled and a new, new use is commenced. Next slide. So tools can also help to create a broader system for planning for, assessing, or managing the total supplies in an area. Looking at the first bullet here, um, and specifically the end of it, <laughs> Um, an important basis for most water planning is to be able to monitor and model the groundwater system because you can't just look at it and see it. Um, determine how much water is there and set goals for, for preserving and using those resources over time. The Department of Water Resources and the U.S. Geological Survey both already do some monitoring of levels of water in certain wells across Arizona. But this monitoring is not currently tied into a program or set of tools to help manage the resources in rural Arizona groundwater basins. Let's go to the next slide. The basis of most successful groundwater management has been the adoption of tools to allocate the available resource and then allow for voluntary transfers when there's a new or changed use. We've talked about the creation of groundwater rights. In most Western states, you must have a groundwater right to use groundwater. And there are other variations on this theme, such as requirements that the impacts of new water uses be offset. Let's go to the next slide. Another kind of tool is programs that facilitate reuse or deliberate replenishment of groundwater supplies. The AMAs in Arizona have a very sophisticated aquifer storage and recovery program in place, as we mentioned. Um, while Arizona communities outside of AMAs can, and in some cases already do, legally engage in recharge projects now under existing law, there's nothing to stop others from coming along and pumping the water that has been so carefully replenished right back out again. So if you think you're putting your water into a bank account when you recharge in these areas, 
It's an account where anyone can make a withdrawal. Thus, there are some places in rural Arizona where recharge projects make a lot of sense and are working, um, but others where the current legal regime really doesn't allow for water users to reap the benefits of programs like these. Go to the next slide. Finally, among the tools are ones that make other tools work better. These are aspects of management systems designed to provide financial resources to help with projects and management, education programs to get and maintain buy-in from communities, and data tools to help collectively manage a resource. Again, we're not saying that any of these tools are the right ones for any particular place, but pointing out that there is a menu of options that have been tested and deployed by people facing similar challenges to those currently being experienced in rural Arizona. This menu today assuredly isn't complete, but it's an example and a start. Next. So there have been efforts in various parts of Arizona to ask the state to authorize new types of special management areas or authorities for local communities. But for the most part thus far, these efforts have met with obstacles. Adopting a framework to allow communities to manage their supplies will ultimately require changes to state laws to support those tools. It will also require considerable dialogue and hashing things out in order to develop sensible solutions that can gain broad community support. So we're going to go back to Haley. Thanks, Jocelyn. Yeah, so in regards to solutions to some of the issues that we are seeing, last legislative session, there were authentic conversations about extending groundwater protections to areas in Arizona that currently have none. We testified in favor of several bills that would have provided rural communities with more options to steward their groundwater resources. One bill would have allowed the Arizona Department of Water Resources to look into the future at potential groundwater level declines and groundwater pumping amounts when determining if an area could be closed off to new agricultural irrigation or to create a new INA. Right now, ADWR can only take into account current levels of groundwater pumping when determining if an area can restrict new agricultural irrigation. Another bill we supported would have allowed the County Board of Supervisors to opt in to a rural management area with the ability to select best management practices suited for their community, some of those tools that Jocelyn mentioned earlier. These bills highlighted the urgent need to address groundwater depletion and provide Arizona communities with additional tools to strengthen groundwater management. While ultimately the bills were only heard for information purposes and they were not voted on, critical conversations were had that set things up for this upcoming legislative session, which will start in January 2021. Next slide. So to hear it from local leaders in areas experiencing the acute, the acute impacts of groundwater level decline, I'm going to read you um, a quote from an Arizona Central article. Representative Regina Cobb pointed out that Mojave County leaders several years ago asked state regulators to step in and prohibit the expansion of irrigated farmlands in areas where groundwater levels were declining. But state officials rejected the request, citing the limitations in the groundwater law. And then Representative Cobb says, we really don't have many tools in our tool belt. So all we can do is expand on the tools we have or create new tools. Next slide. We know that there is much work to do in Arizona. Jocelyn and I both work with the Water for Arizona Coalition and as a coalition of conservation groups, uh, which includes the organizations you see on this slide, uh, we are happy and glad to be a part of the dialogue and we wanna help drive good outcomes for people, communities, local economies, and the birds, fish, and other wildlife that rely on the habitat that groundwater helps to sustain. And we wanna hear your story. What is happening in your community are you seeing the impacts of unrestricted groundwater pumping in your area? Do you have a perspective on solutions? Please reach out to us if you'd like to have a conversation. 
Also, if you have found this presentation helpful in laying a foundation of understanding about these issues, and if you'd like to have it or something similar presented in your community, please do feel free to get in touch with us. Next slide. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And